Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Homicidal Innocence by V. J. Lee. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue. It started with my baby sister. I was six. She was six months old. She got all the attention. It was easy. I smothered her in her sleep. They thought it was SIDS. It was too easy. There was no fight, no struggle. I needed to feel the life leave someone's body. I wanted to watch their eyes go blank as their soul left them. I was eight when I came upon Tommy Lowry, who was 12 and a bully. He was out on the cliffs. I used a rock and bashed him in the head before pushing him off the cliff. I still remember the blood on my face and how much I loved it. By the time his body hit all the jagged rocks on the way down and splashed into the water, there was no evidence that someone hit him in the head. I still smile thinking about the look on his face when I hit him in the head with the rock and the way his arms pinwheeled as he fell from the cliff. That day, I knew this was the life for me. There were other kids and animals, and they all looked like accidents. Then, I got cocky. I was ten. I'd gotten into trouble, and my mother beat me with a belt so bad I could feel the blood running down my legs. I laughed at her. When my father came home, I, he added to the marks on my behind and legs. More bruises, more blood. I laughed at him. It wasn't the first time I was abused so badly I could hardly walk, but it would be the last. They locked me in my room that night because I made it clear I was going to kill them. Their mistake was thinking, because my room was on the second floor, I couldn't get out. They were wrong. I opened the window and pulled off the screen like I had done several times before. It was no problem for me to climb out onto the giant tree by my window. I had no idea if the weather was hot or cold, if there was a breeze or what it smelled like outside. My mind was set on the task at hand. I then scurried across the limbs to their window. They always left their window open. This would be the night I would take advantage of it. As quickly and quietly as possible, not that I cared if they heard me, because it would be the last thing they ever heard, I ripped the screen off their window and entered the room. The first thing that struck me was they slept in the nude and smelled of beer. I stood there, seeing their naked bodies entwined. My father had his leg over my mother. Even in his sleep, his big hand squeezed her naked breast. How fitting it was that they, they die together. I went to my father's nightstand and pulled out the gun he had. I thought it was funny he was the one who taught me from a young age how to use it. I put it to his head, and without pause, I pulled the trigger not once, but three times. When my mother sat up, I shot her in the chest before she could even get enough air in her lungs to scream. Then I went over to her and put two more bullets in her head. Everything went quiet. I stood there looking at them with a smile on my face. I ran my finger through the blood pouring out from her naked chest and gathering some of the blood from his head with a little brain matter, then painted X's over their eyes with it. I was 10 when I was taken into custody. I was 11 when I was sentenced to 12 years. The public felt terrible for me because of the abuse. When I got out, I was given a new identity. They moved me to a different state, so what I did as a child wouldn't affect me as an adult. They were idiots to allow me to walk free. Chapter One, Maya. OMG, would you look at that? He is amazing. He has that whole sexy geek thing down pat with his chiseled jaw and glasses. You could tell he has a hot body under his button-up shirt and dark slacks. He doesn't even have the arms of his shirt rolled up to the elbows, and it's still sexy, Janet explains, not taking her eyes off the guy she's currently drooling over. I keep pushing Benji even higher as he giggles, causing me to smile along with him. So you say every time you see him or we walk by his house, but you've never told me why he doesn't have a nanny. Jenna leans in so her voice doesn't carry. The twins were young when he moved here after his wife passed. They were still young when their mom died, but old enough to know her. John needed a na nanny and found Sarah, who was younger than him and beyond beautiful. And within several months, they were married. Th this I know. I swing my hand out, indicating all the nannies in the park. Look at all these women. They're all young and hot except for Mrs. Gentry. Mrs. Nielsen is smart hiring a much older woman for her nanny. Every nanny around us is young and gorgeous as if they aren't here for the kids but instead for the dads. Other than Mrs. Gentry, I'm one of the oldest at 28. Then a few years later, she was just gone. She snaps her fingers. Just like that. 
She ran off with her personal trainer, devastated poor John, and left his kids without a mom. It turned him against getting a permanent nanny. Now he uses one of those temp agencies when he needs help with Donnie and Danny. She glances over at the dad walking along with his daughter as she swings across the monkey bars. He is cute. Doesn't he date? I ask, still pushing Benji. From what I hear through the nanny vine, he does date, but nothing serious. He doesn't want his kids to get attached to someone who may then leave again. The kids are homeschooled and don't get much time with other kids. Even here at the park, they rarely play with others. She leans in close again. I'd drop these demon spawn in a heartbeat to go work for him. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I don't understand how you can be a nanny and not like kids, but Jenna is looking for a man, not a career like most other nannies here. I love kids, and caring for them is an absolute joy. I can only stare at her, causing her to roll her hazel eyes at me. Come on, Maya. You can't tell me you wouldn't give up being Benji's nanny for a ride on the John Smith train. My eyes swing over to the man in question. He's attractive, seems to love his kids, and is attentive to them. Every nanny on the playground is thrusting their boobs out and twirling their hair, trying to gain his attention instead of taking care of their kids. Spring is on its last legs, so tank tops and shorty shorts are on and making an appearance, too. John's blonde hair is in messy spikes all over his head, but it doesn't appear like he's intentionally trying to get a look. It's more like he has no time or doesn't care. His kids are clean and well-dressed, and their hair is always perfect. It's obvious he takes great care of his children. What does he do? I ask the question, not caring if it's rude. This is Diamond Valley, where the elite of the elite live, and it is usually one of the first questions they all ask. Everyone here has picture-perfect lawns with pools in every backyard. The women wear shoes that cost more than my car and get so much work done, they can't move their faces. The men golf, have ten-car garages for all their toys, and mistresses on the side. They make enough money to own their own country. Everyone has staff and houses in different countries. He made some app that could put crypto banks out of business, so of course it was bought for a ton of money. Uh, I don't think he ever needs to work again, but he still makes apps and invents stuff. Here he has an entire shop in his basement where he works and doesn't let anyone near it. He also does amazing resin pieces. Jenna tosses her bleached blonde hair over her shoulder, no doubt, hoping, hoping to gain his attention, but his attention is on his kids. All the flaunty nannies don't exist to him. It's a nice change of pace, seeing how most of these women are screwing the men they work for, and a few are even taking the wives for a spin. Resin? You know, like live edge tables and coffee tables that have what looks like a river of blue running through them. The really expensive ones. He has a shop outside of town someplace where he works on them, seeing how the HOA won't let him have a shop on the grounds. Jenna adjusts her tiny tank top and adds, So, he's smart and knows how to use his hands. She waggles her eyebrows at me. Thankfully, Benji breaks in. I want to go make a sandcastle now, Maya. Benji is the cutest kid with a head full of bright red curls and cinnamon freckles sprinkled across his nose. His parents, Darlene and Chris Banks, genuinely love each other and only have eyes for each other, which makes me thankful. The last thing I need is to fight off the advances of a horny boss. Between school, work, and family matters, I don't have time for a relationship. And I don't want one, after the disastrous ones I've already been through. I stop the swing, take his hand, and head to the sandbox. I drop my backpack on the ground and sit cross-legged in the sand with Benji, my favorite little human. He leans in. Did you bring the goods? I whisper back. I did. Then I pull out all his favorite things to build the best sandcastle. We begin building an entire town out of sand, living in our own little world. Then I notice a small pair of black tennis shoes. I look up into a pair of bright blue eyes. How do you make it look so good? Donnie asks. I hold up a thermos of water. A little bit of water helps it keep its shape. Donnie crinkles his tiny button nose, then shoves the toe of his shoe into the sand, looking uncertain. Do you want to help us build our town? Benji has never been the shy type. I watch Donnie chew on his pink lip like he's unsure if he should when Danny runs up. Where Donnie has blonde hair cut short, she has long hair and two pigtails. Other than the hair and how they dress, their little faces are almost identical as is their height. Come on, Don, we can't talk to strangers. My name is Benji, and this is Maya. Benji throws his thumb out at me, flinging sand. 
We'll no longer be strangers if you tell us who you are. Benji stands with his dirty little hand sticking out, waiting for them to shake. Danny looks at it, and her lip curls up in distaste. Donnie steps forward like he's ready to take what Benji is offering him, almost like he wants to make a new friend so bad he can't help himself. Danny grabs him by the back of his green t-shirt and pulls him back. There you two are, their dad says, running up to us. Donnie was talking to strangers, and I was telling him to come back to you. Danny rats her brother out. Makes me smile up at her as I try to stand up. To my surprise, John offers me his hand. I wipe my hands off on my jeans and take what he is offering. He pulls me to my feet with a little effort. Thank you. My hand is in his, and he's not letting go. When he realizes he still has my hand in his, he drops the appendage like it burned him. Sorry if they were bothering you. He's tall, causing me to crane my neck up to look at him. His eyes are a dark denim blue color, which I don't think I've ever seen on someone before. They weren't bothering us at all. We'd love to have their help with our city. We swing a hand out toward the beginnings of our creation. John observes our activities momentarily, then turns to his children and speaks to them in a low voice. Benji returns to his sandcastle and shrugs in my direction. The kids gather behind John as he stands tall, towering above me at around six feet. I need to take a call and was planning on taking the kids home with me, but would it be all right if they stayed here and played with you instead? I'll be over there, he points to a nearby picnic table under a large oak tree, and I'll keep an eye on them. I give a comforting wave with my hand and say, of course your kids can join us. Please don't worry. Go ahead and take your call. He smiles gratefully in response. Thank you. He then turns to his children and instructs them to behave while he's away, then jogs off to the table. Donnie sits down on the sand, but Danny looks from me to Benji and then at her brother. Oh, come on, Danny. There are no sharks in the sand, Donnie tells her. I don't think there are any sharks, dumb dumb. You don't know these people. It's as simple as that to her. Dad said it was okay, and we all voted, so sit down and help. His little hand reaches up and tugs on her purple butterfly shirt. With weary eyes, Danny sits, but doesn't pick up anything to play with, nor does she say anything. She looks at me with suspicion shining in her blue eyes. Donnie and Benji start playing right off the bat, which leaves me alone with a scowling Danny. Danny? That's a pretty name. Is it short for Danielle? She shakes her head. This girl is a tough nut to crack, for sure. Daniela? Again with the head shake. Daniel? That makes her lip squirk up in a cute grin before she lowers her face so I can't see. It's just Danny, and I'm just Donnie, and she's just Danny. Donnie pipes in. Well, I'm delighted to have you both playing with us, just Danny and just Donnie. Donnie and Benji both fall over into a fit of laughter. The boys are getting along fabulously as they build a skate park ramp. Danny puts her hand in the sand, repeatedly letting the grains run through her fingers. We can build a dress shop or salon if you'd like, instead of only boy stuff. We can put girl stuff in here as well if you want, I tell her. She looks up at me through impossibly long lashes. I don't know you. What are you, like a hundred years old? I hear Benji gasp and then mutter, rude. No, I'm not quite that old yet. You're too old for my daddy. She makes a fist with the sand in her hand. I think your daddy is older than I am. What are you, nine? I ask. I don't think I should tell you. We're eight and a half, Donnie says with his arm so far in a hole it's up to his shoulder. Donnie, she hisses. What? It's not like it's a secret. She shakes her head, narrowing her eyes in on her brother with an evil look. It would seem Danny is still playing hard nut to crack looking over at her dad, hoping he was still on his call because I want to get on this little girl's good side for whatever reason. She seems so lonely and sad. Maybe a lot mean. Well, I think this town needs more than only boy stuff. I tap on my lips, acting like I'm thinking of what is needed. Danny remains quiet for a long moment. The only sounds are the boys talking about how cool their underground parking garage will be as soon as, as they continue to dig straight down. Maybe a puppy ice cream palace, Danny finally says quietly. Oh, that's brilliant, I exclaim, earning me a small smile. We get started digging and sculpting. Soon, the boys make their way over to us. We like puppies and ice cream too, Benji says. Then come visit once you're done doing your dumb boy stuff. We're working on girl stuff, Danny tells him. Donnie scoots over closer to his sister. We can go get stuff to make the puppies and ice cream cones if you want. Danny purses her lips. 
that is acceptable. But don't go out of sight of Daddy or Maya. I'm not sure why this gives me a little jolt of happiness, but it does. It seems this little girl is taking on the role of a little mommy, and it hurts my heart for her. The boys scatter to find rocks, sticks, and whatever else they deem usable as puppies and ice cream cones. I'm unsure how long we sit in the sand laughing and playing, but I soon feel eyes on me. I look up to find an intense pair of dark denim eyes staring at me. John has a slight smile kicking up his lips as he leans against the slide, taking us all in. He uses a long, well-manicured finger to push up his dark rimmed glasses before approaching us. He has a saunter, making me think he is really packing some muscle under his unassuming button-down shirt. Wow, you are making great progress on the town. Is there room for one more? He asks. Surprisingly, Danny pats, pats the spot between her and me. Right here, Daddy. You can help us with the palace. He takes his seat. I can feel every eye from the young nannies on us. I'm surprised I'm not going up in flames. It doesn't last long as more kids join us with their nannies. The entire sandbox is full of people building a colossal sand town. I don't think Donnie and Danny get much time to play with other kids, and it makes me happy they're having fun. But John seems uncomfortable around all the women, accidentally brushing against him. To my surprise, John waits until it's time for Benji and me to leave before he tells his kids they will be walking us home. The glares from the other girls has me hiding a grin.